Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Song Mei. I'm the host of the joint colloquium today. Yin Chi and Christian are my co hosts today. I guess this is the first joint colloquium between UW and Berkeley, which is made possible by the advanced video meeting technology and by the pandemic. We hope that through this colloquium, we can foster research communications between these two universities and develop a tighter relationship. I would also like to thank the department chairs, San Zhuan and Abel, who have made this joint colloquium possible. Okay, today our agenda is the following. There will be two speakers, Jacob and Emma from Berkeley and UW. Each speaker will give a 30 minutes talk. After the talk today, we will hold a gather town reception from 5 to 5.30. We will send the gather town link in the chat box. Welcome everyone to join the uh, reception. And during the talk, if anyone has questions, you can just raise your hand so that we can let you unmute yourself. Or you can type in the chat box so that we can ask the questions for you. Great, let's get started. Uh, our first speaker is Professor Jacob Sinhart from UC Berkeley. Jacob is an assistant professor of statistics. His work focuses on making machine learning reliable and aligned with human values, touching on topics such as robustness, interpretability, and value learning. He also is also a, tech, a technical advisor for open philanthropy. So today, Jacob will tell us about the science of measurement in machine learning. I'm very looking forward to your talk, Jacob. Uh, great, yeah. Thank, thanks a lot, Song, um, and uh, th thanks for inviting me and, and for helping to organize this. Um, having been uh, the uh, the uh, colloquium organizer last year, I know how much work it is. Uh, so I, I really appreciate that uh, that we're even innovating this year and coming up with new colloquia. Uh, so as Song mentioned, I'll be talking about uh, the science of measurement in machine learning. So this is. Um, this is maybe uh, an unusual topic, but I think it's actually a, a quite important and timely one. So let me explain what I mean by measurement. So um, measurement is basically any way of extracting data from machine learning models or some other system uh, that bears upon some important hypothesis. And uh, I want to argue that we actually, in, in machine learning, don't actually measure things enough. So this might seem perhaps uh, strange because machine learning is a, a very obsessively focused uh, empirical field, very, very empirical. In fact, uh, I think many statisticians might even complain that there's not enough uh, underlying uh, theoretical understanding. But despite its empiricism, it kind of focuses only on one measure, which is uh, the test accuracy. And actually, I think the problem with machine learning is not that there's like not enough math in it, um, but actually that uh, we're only measuring one thing and we, we need sort of a richer understanding. Uh, and once we have kind of a, a richer understanding and more measurements, the kind of statistics will actually follow. Um, and so just to say things other than test accuracy that you could care about, uh, you might care about the variability of models across random seeds. You might care about ways of visualizing the models. Uh, you might uh, care about the influence of training data on the models predictions on new points. Um, and, you know, all of these, I think, tell, you know, more interesting information than just the test accuracy by itself. And while papers don't really talk about these very much, we actually already know intuitively that we should care about things like this. Uh, because whenever we debug, we don't just print the test accuracy, but we print out lots of other measurements about uh, what a model is doing as well. Uh, in addition to kind of this high level point, I actually think uh, historically, measurement is very well supported as kind of a very consistently good move to do in, in basically every scientific field. Um, so examples of this are uh, the microscope kind of immediately led to a bunch of interesting discoveries such as the existence of red blood cells and spermatozoa in biology. Um, crystallography was also a huge driver of uh, progress in molecular biology in the mid 20th century. So here's actually a quote uh, by, by Francis Crick, who was one of the uh, discoverers of DNA. So he says, uh, as you know, at the atomic level, X-ray crystallography turned out to be extremely powerful in determining the three-dimensional structure of macromolecules. The list of techniques is not static. They're getting faster all the time. We have a saying in the lab that the difficulty of a project 
goes from the Nobel Prize level to the master's, master's thesis level in 10 years. So basically what he's saying is, you know, there was this measurement tool crystallography. We just got better at using it. And the rate at which we got better was such that things that would have been, you know, the pinnacle of the field uh, that would make you world famous could be done by master's students 10 years later. And, and to me, that's actually quite astounding progress. And that progress actually went on for decades and was one of the key drivers um, in uh, molecular biology. It was kind of this symbiosis between new discoveries that pushed people to build measure, measurement apparatuses that uh, drove new, even more discoveries. <clears throat> So that's kind of a historical perspective, but I think it's worth thinking about what this means in the context of machine learning. Um, so in machine learning, I think there's several trends that can help us to measure things better that we're partly utilizing, but we can utilize much more. So one is just cheaper computation. The easier it is to run experiments, uh, the easier it is to, to get more measurements. And uh, Moore's law is just making computation cheaper and cheaper. I think this does actually help quite a bit. Um, now you can you know, train many variations on a model to see how they differ from each other and, and run ablations to see what's really important. Um, another is kind of new paradigms that allow you to kind of interrogate models in new ways. I, I won't really talk about this so much, um, but what I will talk about, which will be kind of the focus of this talk is better statistics. So actually there's some things that uh, are maybe can be measured but are very noisy or, or, or a bit subtle and better statistics can tell us how to do this. Um, so this talk is going to kind of explain that using two case studies uh, about measurement. Uh, one is measuring data point level variability or, or actually trying to overcome the noise from data point level variability to get information about individual data points. Um, and the other is on measuring the similarity between uh, different neural, net re neural network representations. Um, so, so let's start with this kind of uh, variation issue and, and let me explain a bit more uh, what I mean by it. Uh, so the motivation here is as kind of uh, said already, average test case or average accuracy on a test set is not the whole story. Uh, so for instance, uh, while in machine learning there tends to be this trend that just larger models trained on more data tend to be better, this isn't uh, actually always true. Uh, there's some work suggesting that actually larger models sometimes do worse on rare subgroups. And then separately, uh, another way in which we can see it's not the whole story is that models that are similar in distribution often have actually very different out of distribution accuracy. And so somehow we want kind of more fine grained information uh, than just the test accuracy. And arguably, the most fine grain you could possibly get is just looking at individual data points um, and look at, looking at how different models uh, not differ not just on their overall test accuracy, but at the resolution of a single data point. Uh, and so this is what we're going to try to do to better understand models. But the issue is that this is very noisy, so we're going to have to, uh, have to deal with it somehow. Um, so when I say noisy, maybe I need to say you know, what exactly is noise. Uh, so, so in general, whenever we want to measure something, we want to care about what is noise and what is signal. So for me, noise here is going to be uh, random initialization. So if, if I train the same model twice, but with just a different random seed, and it makes different predictions on a single data point, uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to think of that as just kind of noise. And what I really care about is kind of the average prediction it would make uh, over those random seeds. Another thing is the particular draw of the uh, training set. So uh, I don't mean the data distribution, but I mean the particular samples I happen to see. For instance, if you know I had had different cross validation folds and I got different results, again, I would want to kind of average out that that as just noise. Um, but there are there are other things that could affect predictions that I really do care about that I'll count as signal, such as the choice of the model architecture. Um, the actual training data distribution that I use, um, and other things that are kind of, you know, really we want to think of as systematic. Um, so uh, we tried to kind of understand this signal while ignoring the noise. Um, and this was work uh, with the student, Rei Chi Zhang. And so we want ways of measuring things at the resolution of data points that, that are basically going to be sensitive to what we care about, but not what we don't care about. 
Um, the problem, though, is that actually it turns out there's a lot of noise, like like really an astounding amount of noise. And, and this is something actually that I think anyone doing empirical ML work should really keep in mind. I think this is underappreciated. So uh, what this table shows is that what, what we did is we, we trained five different models. They're all pretty similar, but they just have different numbers of parameters. So think of them as having different complexity. Um, we trained them and then uh, we just trained them again with a different random seed. Uh, so there's two different types of random seeds, the fine tuning seed, the pre-training seed. Um, don't worry about that too much. And, and you can just look at this, this column on the pre-training seed. But I guess the things I want to point out are, uh, first of all, as we increase the model complexity, uh, the model becomes more accurate. So it increases from about 74% accuracy to 84% accuracy. This is on a natural language task that's trying to uh, test whether two sentences are um, are uh, logically entailed or, or not logically entailed. So it's kind of a, a simple natural language processing task. Um, so this is just the overall accuracy. You can see that as we increase from a mini to a large model, it increases in accuracy by about 10 percentage points. This is increasing the model size by uh, several orders of magnitude, by the way. Um, but if we just change the random seed of a single model, the number of predictions that flip, so this is a binary prediction test, so the number of predictions that flip is actually also 10%. It's in fact a bit more than 10%. So the difference across random seed is larger than the difference from increasing uh, the model size by many orders of magnitude. Um, I, in contrast, if we just look at the average accuracy, the average accuracy is actually very stable. So individual data points are changing by a ton but somehow it's all washing out and uh, the actual overall accuracy is changing by a very small amount. And this is, this is kind of a, a typical phenomenon. So this isn't cherry picked. Um, so before I go into kind of like what we're gonna do about this, if we care about individual data points, are, are there any questions about anything I've said so far? Okay, so, um, so remember our goal is to kind of understand uh, models at the level of individual data points. In principle, we could do this by, you know, just training with many different random seeds and trying to average out the randomness. And we'll do something like that, but that's actually quite expensive. And even after you do that, there is still some noise left. And even that small amount of noise can actually really screw you up, it turns out. Um, so, so we're going to try to deal with that. And we're going to do this in, in the context of a particular case study of understanding the effect of model size. So the point here is that bigger models have higher average accuracy, uh, but some data points uh, probably are getting worse, like at the data point level, even if the average accuracy is getting higher. And so we'd like to understand how often this happens and maybe what these data points look like. And so the goal is to ask which data points decay on average across random seeds in accuracy as I make my model larger. So this is a question we're going to try to understand. Where this on average, you can think of as a population average, if I were to average over, say, infinitely many different random seeds. But of course, I can only ever observe um, some finite number of models. And so we can kind of look at at least this finite average. Um, if we, so we can sort of histogram the difference between the difference in accuracy between a uh, large model and a small model empirically, where we average over some number of models. So if we only average over one model, then the difference in accuracy at for a given data point has to either be zero, one, or minus one. Um, and sort of most of them are zero. So most of the predictions don't change. But as we saw, about 10% of the predictions do change. Um, if we instead take an average of 50 models, now we can have uh, differences that are more nuanced than just zero or one. And you get kind of this, uh, this histogram. It's skewed. There's sort of more stuff on the right than the left. Uh, that's because it's the difference between a larger model and a smaller model. The larger model is on average bigger, so you should have this skew. But remember, what we're interested in is kind of how many instances actually get, uh, get worse for the larger model. 
And so you could say, OK, what should that be? Maybe it should just be this uh, left tail, how much mass is in this left tail. Um, but that's pretty bad, because if you do that, or sorry, that's like kind of what we want in the limit of infinite data. But with finite data, this can be quite bad, because this is kind of just some like threshold function at 0. And there's actually a lot of mass at 0, right? Because a lot of points don't move that much. So there's tons and tons of mass at 0. And so actually, whether you say less than 0 or less than or equal to 0 even like changes the answer by quite a bit. And so this is going to be very statistically noisy. And so you're going to want to do something better. And the better approach is actually to compare to a certain baseline estimator uh, that allows us to rigorously bound uh, the false positive rate and actually say, uh, get, get a rigorous upper bound or lower bound on the uh, number of examples that actually do get worse. Um, so uh, the basic idea is to just kind of have a control task. So we'll say compare uh, mini, you know, we were, we, we have two model sizes, maybe called them mini and base, and we want to understand, uh, you know, you can see how many data points are improving or, or getting worse going from mini to base, but it's kind of a noisy estimate. So we might want to subtract out the noise uh, by comparing to some baseline of, of just going from mini to mini. Um, that turns out to not be quite the best idea because the like average model size for mini to mini is it's like only small models, whereas mini to base is small and large models. So a slightly better idea, and, and there's actually several reasons this is a better idea that I won't get into, is you want to actually compare a like 50-50 mixture of mini and base to a 50-50 mixture of mini and base. Um, but this gives you kind of some like uh, you know simulated uh, control that tells you kind of how much noise you would expect under a null hypothesis. Um, and it turns out that you can actually uh, use this to rigorously upper bound uh, the, uh, the false positive uh, rate. So I, I guess I won't go, this is maybe more detail than I'll have time to go into, but the sort of theorem we can say is, um, let uh, decay be the true fraction of data points that are worse for the uh, larger model. Then for any threshold t that I pick, uh, the decay, uh, the number, the fraction of decaying points is at least the probability that uh, this blue histogram we saw before is less than or equal to t minus the probability that this sort of baseline control histogram is less than or equal to t. So Another way of thinking about that is, you know, you can instead plot these histograms as like cumulative distribution functions and find kind of the largest vertical distance. Um, and once you do that, you get a lot of interesting insights. So it turns out that uh, around two to 6% of points actually do get worse at, or at least 2.6, to 6% of points do get worse. Um, that's compared to, again, these, uh, models on average are only increasing in accuracy by about two to nine percent. So, even though on average uh, we're increasing in accuracy by by you know two to nine percent, actually uh, a comparable number of points are getting worse. So, so that's kind of interesting. It's somehow these larger models are not really uniformly better, and and it's actually quite non-uniform. So what we found is that there's usually about a three to one ratio of, of improvement to decay. So, um, so this overall accuracy gain comes from something like, say, uh, you know, maybe if we're looking at going from mini to large, 21% uh, of points get better, 6% of points get worse. This kind of averages out to about a 9% accuracy gain. Or from mini to small, 9% of points get better, 3% of points get worse. Uh, averages out, it turns out to about a 2% accuracy gain. Um, and that that's kind of this three to one ratio is pretty consistent across this table. So so this is this was kind of the interesting finding, but we couldn't have gotten this finding without this kind of uh, good way of controlling uh, the false positive rate. Um, so uh, so are there, are there any questions about uh, about these results before I move on? Okay. 
So I guess just uh, a takeaway here is, remember, we wanted to understand things at the level of individual data points because we thought it would give us more information than, uh, than the overall test accuracy. Uh, it poses a big statistical challenge because of this high amount of variation. Uh, but this is surmountable with this uh, FPR control technique. And once we do that, we can kind of see this interesting phenomenon that there actually are a lot of points getting worse. And I guess we're actually currently trying to understand what those points look like. So they are somewhat more likely to have label error and things like this, but not overwhelmingly more likely. And otherwise, we haven't yet found uh, clear patterns. So we're sort of still trying to investigate that. Um, so that's kind of part one. And so part two is another measurement challenge, which is trying to understand uh, the similarity between different uh, neural network models. So I guess, what do I mean by this? So in, in machine learning, many models are, are these neural networks. Um, these neural networks have different layers. And it's often kind of, people are often interested in understanding if I have two networks that are maybe trained on the same data but have different architectures, do they, for instance, tend to have kind of corresponding layers where maybe the work done by one model at one layer is pretty similar to the work done by another model at another layer. And to kind of do this, uh, people have designed these kind of interpretability tools that try to measure the similarity between different representations. Um, they'll use various tools for this. Uh, one common thing is canonical correlation analysis. Uh, there's another technique called CK. Um, and so this is kind of a, a sort of like burgeoning uh, field within ML interpretability. Um, and to kind of just say mathematically how this works, if you're, you're sort of given a data set of size n and you have some uh, neural network where it has a layer with p neurons, um, and so then given any data point, uh, those p neurons will give you like a p-dimensional feature vector. So you can construct this n by p matrix A of, of these uh, features. And so then what we want to do is given two different neural networks, we want to define some distance metric, uh, D of AB between these representations. Um, the challenge is, I, I guess this isn't a, the specific challenge we're focusing on, but it, sort of in this field, a big challenge is that this metric needs to be uh, permutation invariant because neural networks are only identified up to permutations. And often you want it to be unitarily invariant as well. Um, so, uh, so we want, uh, so I guess we wanted to kind of understand these metrics. Um, this is work with a student, Francis Ding, where kind of the big issue here was that activations, uh, can be very sensitive to noise. And if the activations or the features are sensitive to noise, as we saw in part one, then the metric could be as well. Um, I guess I realize I'm kind of out of time, or I don't know how much time I have left song, but I assume I should finish soon. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, yeah. So um, so I guess I, I won't really have time to go into detail of kind of what we did here, but I guess the, the rough idea is that we tried and we came up with various statistical properties that we think that good metrics should satisfy. And we found that uh, existing metrics don't satisfy these. For instance, uh, random initialization noise can completely overwhelm all of the signal in some existing metrics. And so we use statistical hypothesis testing uh, to design better metrics that actually don't have these noise problems. Um, but uh, I think I'll maybe stop there. And uh, I don't know if we have time for questions, but, uh, but I'll leave that to Song. And uh, thanks for uh, listening to this talk. Thank you, Jacob. It's a great talk. Uh, in how how do we accept questions? I think well, generally, like uh, people or participants can ask questions either by raising their hands or using the type of the question in the Q and A or chat box, and the, and then we'll just, yeah. If if they, they they raise their hand, we can we can unmute them and they can ask questions directly. Or if they if they they are shy, they can just always use the Q and A just type the questions. Okay. I think there's a question by Sheridan. So let me just, okay, I think I already, oh, yeah, Sheridan. Can yeah, I'm here. 
Um, I was wondering if you have uh, tried or been able to um, like disprove any prominent applied machine learning results just from this, uh, you know, random initialization or training noise perspective? Yeah, so I think we, we're kind of in the process of doing that for, um, for some like interpretability related claims. Although uh, I think we're still trying to decide which ones we really believe are, are true or, or not true. But uh, an example here would be uh, people will make claims about whether earlier layers or later layers in neural networks change more during training based on these similarity metrics. Um, but it seems quite possible that some of those results are dominated by noise. So we're trying to figure out um, which of those should sort of survive. Um, uh, unfortunately, I don't have like a complete answer uh, to that yet, but that might be an example of, of a kind of uh, disproving thing that you might try to do. Yeah, yeah, that sounds cool. No, nothing in the realm of like, you know, everyone's competing to get the next highest accuracy on the MNIST images. And then you can show that, you know, half of the people who set a new record in that actually just got lucky from noise. Are, are you looking at anything like that or is that not really of interest? So I think, well, so I think that, yeah, I think not as much, although not because it's not interesting. I mean, that's clearly very interesting, um, but, as far as I can tell, that's not really true. In fact, actually, um, one of your colleagues in uh, the CS department has done some very cool work on this, one of your incoming colleagues, uh, Ludwig Schmidt. So he actually uh, recollected uh, uh, the CIFAR and ImageNet data sets and found uh, there's an accuracy drop, but the ordering of, uh, of models actually stays almost the same. So the models that did well, even though they might've looked like they, you might've worried they were overfitting are actually still doing well when you recollect the data. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. actually cool and kind of surprising, so. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. So, so this is why like the average accuracy, the like average test accuracy, I think is actually very stable and not very subject to noise. It's really the individual data point accuracy that's very uh, non-stable. Okay, and now I see uh, there's uh, two questions. One, oh, a couple of people raised their hands and uh, there's a, a question that's in the Q&A there from Gerald. He asked, that it, it appears that if we can measure which data points gets worse for larger data and larger models, then we can create a better model where those points get classified, classified by a smaller model and the other points get classified by a larger model. So it's like a mixture of expert ideas. And is that right? Um. Yeah, so that's a good question. I think the answer is, well, you need to not just be able to measure it, but you need to be able to predict it, right? Because these measurements are taking advantage of the fact that I can see the true labels. Um, it turns out you actually can also uh, predict it, not super accurately, but you can train a classifier that is correct uh, at better than chance. So I think it is true that you could then uh, do some sort of mixture of experts thing uh, to do even better, yeah. Um, although it's not clear that, that would outperform just like using that computational budget to make your model even larger, but I, I think it could. It's, it's not totally clear to me though. Um, and I think, yeah. Cool. And I think, yeah, because of the time limits, so I, th and so I think we'll, if you have questions for Jacob, I think we can yeah, defer the question at the end of the talk or like in the gather time, I think we can, yeah, we'll have, we'll host a gather time event afterwards. So I think maybe, we should now move on to the next talk by Emma. So Emma Perkovich is a assistant, currently is a, she's an assistant professor in the Department of Statistics at the UW at the University of Washington. Emma got her PhD from ET Ridge Rurich, uh, with, uh, working with Marlos Mathias. And Emma is working on a lot of very exciting work in causal inference and graphical math. Today, she's going to talk about causal effects in MP tags and identification and minimal in, in, enumerations. Yes, that's great. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to speak. It's, a, it's, it's really fun. Okay, so yes, to, today I'm going to be talking about some joint work with Richard Guo, who is actually a PhD student at the department here and finishing soon. So yeah. Okay, so first the goal of this particular project and a lot of projects I work on is to estimate the total causal effect of some variable or variables A 
on the response or responses Y. And generally, the way that you do, it in do this in practice is by designing a randomized control study, where, for example, you sp split your participants in a randomly in two groups, and one group receives some treatment, and the other group receives a control. And after a certain time, you compare the two responses to see whether your treatment has some causal effect on your response. So in this scenario, you can imagine this intervention um, as kind of a do an outside intervention that sets your uh, treatment to a certain fixed level A. So we call this a do intervention. And then we want to see the change that happens in the response due to this different setting of treatment. But the kind of interesting part about this project is that we would like to do that from observational data rather than from randomized control studies data. And so the challenging part here is that the distribution of your response is generally different from in observational data in the, the randomized control studies data. Okay, so throughout the talk, I'm going to use this DAG, uh, use this graph as my uh, example. So this is a direct day cyclic graph or DAG, and each vertex in this graph represents a random variable. And each edge in the graph represents some direct causal relation. So here A is a direct cause of Y, uh, and C, for example, is a cause of both A and Y. So if A is our treatment uh, in our scenario and Y is the response, C would be known as a confounder. So directed acyclic graph just means that we do not have cycles in this graph. So here, for example, since C to A to Y, we cannot uh, turn this edge the other way. That wouldn't be a DAC. Okay, so how do we connect <clears throat> these DAGs with uh, randomized controlled trials. So if you consider something like a do intervention when you, where you set ran, or you randomize your treatment to be a certain uh, level, you can visualize this graphically by kind of cutting off inputs into A. So here, because now the C has no longer an influence on the value that A takes, uh, we have cut off this edge. And in this scenario where you have a this randomized controlled trial scenario, the only way to propagate the uh, the effect of treatment to the response is through causal paths in this graph. This is why in this scenario, you can kind of uh, compute this causal effect by just comparing the two different responses. And then we don't have data from this scenario. We have data from this scenario, but we would kind of like uh, to pretend as if we have data from this randomized control trial, right? To be able to estimate this total causal effect. So how do we connect in general DAGs and distributions? So we would say that uh, a DAG is causal if first all observational joint distribution and all interventional joint distributions factorize according to the DAG. So factorize in this particular way. So this, if B are all of your uh, variables, then you can factorize it as a product of each variable given its parents in the DAG, right? And then in the interventional distribution factorizes exactly the same way, except you drop this term uh, of A because A is now fixed, right? So here in this example of this DAG, we have that F, B, A, Y factorizes F of Y given B and A, so Y given its parents, A given its parent, and B. And the interventional distribution simply drops this term um, of A. Okay, so what is then a causal effect? So a total causal effect will be some function of the interventional distribution of the response. So it could be, for example, this difference in expectations. Uh, when you increase your treatment by one, it could be derivative of the expectation of the response with respect to treatment. It could be some odds ratio, risk ratio. It very much depends on your question of interest, but it's always some function of the interventional distribution of the response, right? And so we will say that the causal effect is generally identifiable from observational data if this, inter if this interventional distribution of the response can be computed from the observational joint distribution. Right, so then you can, of course, build an estimator based on how you define your total causal effect. And so using this slide and the previous slide, you now know that if I give you a causal DAG, every total causal effect can be identified. So you can think about here how we would identify F of Y given to A. So we know how to decompose the joint interventional density in terms of observational parts. And then we can simply integrate over everything that is not Y here. This is this particular formula is known as the G formula, and you can actually always use it to identify a total causal effect if you know the true causal DAC. So that's great, and it seems to solve our issue, uh, right? Of how do you identify a total causal effect in this DAG? But the problem with this uh, type of reasoning for me is that if we are trying to estimate the causal effect from observational data, we might want to know whether this graph is something we can learn from observational data. 
And here in particular, the case, um, the, the truth is that we cannot learn this DAG in full generality from observational data. What we can learn instead is a structure like this. So this is called a completed partially directed acyclic graph or CPDAG for short. And we can see that it has all these undirected edges now. Now in general, a CPDAG can have both undirected and directed edges. It just so happens that this particular CPDAG has only undirected edges. So what do these undirected edges mean? So if you look at this edge A to Y, it means that we don't know whether in our true causal DAG, the direction is this way or this other way, right? So you can imagine this graph as kind of a summary graph that represents an equivalence class of DAGs. And each of these DAGs can be a true causal DAG and you don't know which one is the true causal DAG. Now, uh, sometimes in addition to observational data, you may have other information like from experts or prior experiments or from certain parametric restrictions you're willing to impose that may tell you some additional causal links here. So for example, if we know that A causes Y, we may choose to include this edge in our graph. And now we have a partially directed acyclic graph or a PDAG. And we can use this knowledge actually to further infer some additional edges based on the acyclicity of our underlying graph, right? So this leads us to a maximally oriented partially directed acyclic graph or an empty DAG for short, right? And so this graph now also represents an equivalence class of DAGs, which is smaller than the one we originally started with, right? Okay, so if this is something we can learn from observational data or observational data and some background knowledge, uh, the question is, when can we actually identify a causal effect in a structure like this? Okay, so what do I mean when I say identify a causal effect here? So at the very least, I mean that for all the graphs in the equivalent class, I want the effect to be the same, right? To be, so that way it's unique across the equivalence class. All right, so this is kind of the framework that I have in mind when I think about causal problems. And that is a, kind of a two-step procedure where you start from some uh, data and perhaps some background knowledge, you use this information to learn a causal graph, uh, and then you use this causal graph to first identify a total effect and then to build an estimator of it. So here I'm assuming, uh, first of all, that I have no latent variables, so pretty strong assumptions there. And I'm actually not going to be discussing this first step of the procedure, so we'll be focusing on the second step in this talk. For this first step, I've listed some algorithms that you could use to kind of make this leap. Uh, and obviously, uh, we can always improve on these algorithms, so I definitely welcome any contribution to that effect. But okay, so if we have enough data, uh, we could estimate this causal graph, which can be a DAG, uh, if, for example, our background knowledge is maximally informative, right? We don't have any causal uncertainty left. It could be a CP DAG, if, for example, your background knowledge is not informative at all, uh, or it could be an MP DAG, if it's something in between, right? So perhaps you have a bit more information than just observational data, perhaps you have no more uh, information. So this MPDAG is kind of as a graph class uh, more general than the other two and actually subsumes uh, the other two graph classes in the way that I, I just explained. So that's why I talk about identifying total effects in MPDAGs. Okay, great. So how do we do that? Uh, how do we identify total causal effects? Uh, and if we cannot identify a total causal effect, can we kind of enumerate a set of possible total causal effects that would contain the truth? So this um, first, this is a result from last year's UAI, and it's a graphical condition. It's a necessary and sufficient condition for being able to identify the total causal effect. So it says that all possibly causal paths from your A to Y need to start with a directed edge in G. And I'll just try to give an intuition for why that, uh, that would be important, right? So here, a possibly causal path from A to Y is first just this edge. And obviously that starts with a directed edge, so that's fine. Another possibly causal path from A to Y here is this path through C, A, C, Y, right? And what we mean by possibly causal is that there is a DAG in the equivalence class represented by this MP DAG where this path is causal. But actually because this path starts with an undirected edge, there is also definitely a, a DAG in the equivalence class where this path is non-causal, all right? So essentially, you don't know whether this information that propagates from A to Y through C is part of your causal effect and should be counted towards it, or whether it's not a part of your causal effect and should be in a way subtracted from the total information propagated from your treatment to the response, right? So because of this ambiguity, 
uh, we do not know, uh, we, we cannot identify uniquely a causal effect here. And this is actually something that happens fairly often if you try to estimate, uh, to identify causal effects from observational data, where it's really not uh, supposed to be possible to do this in generality. So often you end up in these cases where you cannot uniquely identify a total effect. So here, what you might think about doing is, well, why can't we, for example, enumerate a set of possible total causal effects that would contain a true causal effect? And then at the very least, we can give, a, for example, a minimum uh, or like a range of possible effects, right? Okay, so how do we do that? And what do we want to do? So, right, an MPDAG is an equivalence class graph. So what we are trying to do is actually, we're trying to partition this equivalence class in such a way that the causal effect is identifiable for each element of the partition, okay? So some ways that uh, people have done this already. So the first thing that you can think about doing is, well, I can just enumerate all DAGs. I've already told you that the causal effect is identifiable given a DAG. So we could obtain an estimate for each DAG and that will give us our range of possible total effects, right? Another thing, so notice this is from 2020, people have been doing this for, for longer. <laughs> so another uh, thing people know is that as soon as you know the orientation of all the edges that are neighboring your treatment, you can estimate a causal effect. So another approach that you might think about is can I enumerate over all valid orientations of the neighboring edges next to A? Right, so in a sense, uh, valid parent sets of A. And the third approach that would kind of come out of this uh, theorem directly as well is why don't we just consider like all valid uh, combina combinations of orientations of edges next to A that are on these possibly causal paths to Y. In terms of computational complexity, right, if you think about it, uh, all DAGs, this would take quite a long time to kind of enumerate over. This is already better, the second, second approach, but we would expect that the third approach is kind of the fastest. So another, uh, another kind of quality of this enumeration that you might want to have is that it's minimal, meaning that between the different kind of uh, elements of your partition, the causal effect is different. And within each uh, kind of representative of the partition that the causal effect is the same. So why might you want that? Uh, so if you imagine that you have some multiplicity, so for example, you have two elements of your partition that have the same effect. If you are using a slightly different estimator to estimate your total causal effect, uh, and if you don't have an infinite amount of data, right, likely you would end up with results that are slightly different. And sorry, is there a question? Sorry, I thought maybe I heard something. Okay. Is there a question actually? Doesn't seem to. Okay. I don't think there's a question. <laughs> All right. So, um, right. So what I was saying is if you're, if you're trying to use different estimators in uh, different elements of your partition, you don't want to uh, be led to think that there is more causal, possible causal effects than there in fact are. Meaning that in this, possible a set in the set of possible causal effects that we estimate, we want there, if there is a difference between two effects, we want this difference to be causal, right? We want it to be as, because the causal uh, effect is different in these different elements of the partition. And we don't want it to be due to some kind of statistical inaccuracy because you don't have enough samples or because of some other reasons. And so an interesting part about these three uh, kind of strategies for enumerating these possible total causal effects is that none of them are actually minimal. So that was a bit surprising to us. So perhaps not so surprising for all DAGs, right? If you enumerate over all DAGs, likely there will be two DAGs that have the same effect. So not too surprising. But what was surprising to us was that even this third strategy that's kind of based on this necessary and sufficient criterion would lead to some multiplicities here of enumeration. So let's let's think about why that might happen. <laughs> so what do I mean by enumerating over all possible combinations for these edges next to A that are on possibly causal paths to Y? So how would we construct that algorithm? So you can think about taking one of these edges, uh, let's call it A1V1, that is on a proper possibly causal path to Y. And then from taking this edge, you can form two MPDAGs. So one that has the background knowledge information of it being in one direction and another that has uh, 
the kind of converse information, right? And you can iterate over these MPDEX uh, in the same way until you uh, identify the total causal effect. So let's see what that looks like in terms of our uh, example graph that we had before. So I've just removed that edge YD because it just clutters up the slide, right? So here we have two possibly causal paths, so ACY and ABCY, that are actually uh, that start with an undirected edge. So we have two problems. So we might first choose to recurse on this edge AB, right? So you can include the background knowledge of it being oriented in one way and also the other way. And now in both of these MPDAGs, the causal effect is still not identifiable because of this edge AC. So you can further recurse one more time to uh, kind of come up with these four MPDAGs that now all satisfy that theorem we had on a previous slide, meaning that the causal effect is identifiable in all four of these MPDAGs. But it so turns out that for these two MPDAGs here, the effect is actually the same. And furthermore, I can remove actually the information of these orientations without uh, losing identifiability. So the causal effect is actually of A on Y is identifiable in this empty bag already. So why is that? So we still have that this A, B, C, Y starts with an undirected edge, but now the thing that has changed is that this path is no longer possibly causal because uh, of the orientation of this edge C, A, right? We will never allow this path to be causal because that would cause us to have a cycle in our graph. And because we are assuming that the underlying graph is a DAG, that is not allowed. So essentially, the orientation of this edge CA determines already the causal, non-causal status of this other path that it is not on. So if we had instead started with our MPDAG and started by first orienting this edge AC, right, if we recursed first on AC, then we would immediately here uh, come up with that MPDAG we had before. So here the causal effect is identifiable. Here we still need to recurse one more time to get all three actually distinct, uh, distinct MPDAGs uh, that represent the partition of this equivalence class. All right, so this was our, uh, our insight essentially is that the ordering in which you kind of look at these orientations actually matters. So AC should be oriented first because it determines the causal and non-causal status of two different paths. And so this is how we kind of come up with our algorithm here, which is just to say, uh, you should start with the shortest one first. And it doesn't matter which, of, for example, if you have two shortest paths, uh, it doesn't matter which one you start with first. Uh, so just choose any shortest path and recurse on that one first, and then iterate over that until you kind of enumerate over all possible uh, combinations. And so we can actually show that this, uh, that if you do this type of algorithm, then the output will be complete and minimal in that sense that we described before. And by kind of, uh, in contrast, the existing algorithms would all output four different effects for this example, which may be a problem, right? If we're de dealing with finite sample cases. Okay. So I actually have some examples and it seems I have some time to go over them. So that's great. Uh, so we did a little simulation here just to show that there is actually a difference whether if you're, if you're looking, if you're working with something like small samples in terms of these different estimates that you get output. So this is uh, the true causal DAG here that was used to generate the data. And this is the CP DAG. And we are first looking at the effect of A1 on Y. And so here we list the four different MPDAGs that, that represent this partition of our equivalence class, meaning the different effects. So the true effect is three, but we don't know that. We know that these are the true possible effects. And if we use the, the method we propose with the algorithm we propose, then these are the estimates you obtain of the possible effects. Uh, in contrast, the other um, S, no, sorry, the other existing algorithms that can do the same thing tend to output some multiplicity. So for example, this one doesn't output actually different effects. So these are actually identical, but it does output a multiplicity of this effect 2.1. Uh, and these here actually outputs two different estimates for this one effect. 
it gets worse if you think about having multiple treatments, um, especially because of something, especially if you have something like a time dependent treatment. So if you're uh, familiar with that, then that would help you kind of understand the issue. So here, if we are looking at the effect of A1 and A2 on Y, joint effect, right? Then the true possible effects, uh, according to what we generated, are these four. And with our method, we get exactly four different uh, possible total effects. This, uh, this method actually now underestimates the number of possible total effects, which is uh, unfortunate. And this other method that can be used in that case that is existing, uh, out outputs multiples of the same effect that actually look very different. So for example, this effect, uh, this effect, this effect, and this effect are all supposed to be 2, 1, right? But they look very different. Okay. Uh, yes, I also have some other simulations, right? So in general, if you kind of look at the number of possible true effects versus the number of estimates, so you want this number to be exactly y is equal to x, right, on this line. <clears throat> and so this is what our, uh, what our method does, but the multiplicities in other methods can kind of vastly overestimate how many possible effects there are. And in the case where you have joint uh, interventions, so joint effects, we see here in red the other method that kind of underestimates the number of possible total causal effects. And the first method, sorry, the last method that overestimates the number of possible causal effects, uh, while well, we can get kind of exactly the right number. So, yeah, uh, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Uh, and if you have questions, I'm happy to answer. Okay, thank you, Emma. And any questions for Emma? Awesome. Actually, I myself have a quick question. So I'm just curious that, uh, so yeah, this is a very beautiful method. And uh, I, but I assume that when the graph is like when the original, you, the, the, the original graph is larger than I think it's actually going to contain a couple of several possible results, right? Possible, possible effect. Values. Yeah, 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 yes, yes. Uh, so this one, oh, you mean because of that additional edge, YD, oh, or is uh, it? Yeah. Right, like if I now have another another node like a D, which connects the B and C, you know, like and other other things, then that's oh, yeah, yeah, right, right. Yes, yes, yes. So, so of course it can get uh, more complicated. So for for me, even just adding. So remember, like when we talked about the CP DAG, we also didn't have this orientation A Y. So I added that for this example. Uh, but if we didn't have that, obviously we would still double our effects, and we would have a lot of zeros additional. So, yeah. Uh, it can get arbitrarily complex depending on how connected your graph is. Yeah. I see, I see. Any questions? Sorry. Actually, can I just ask another question? Just out of curious. So I, I understand that in, in practice, you probably would estimate the effect. And for each graph, each result, you also count for a confidence interval. So you are going to get, because it's suppose you don't know the truth. Mm -hmm. So suppose you, your example, you have four parts of estimator. So you're going to have four parts of confidence intervals. And each of them actually representing like one possible. <laughs> so that graph is correct. And this is should be the event and the other. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's definitely, yeah, uh, definitely. So here we are estimating kind of our range. So different possible total effects. And you can kind of associate each of these effects with a confidence interval. So here I'm just listing kind of enumerating over all possible identifiable causal effects. You can then on top of that, think about how do you estimate each effect efficiently? And then you can kind of try to bound, right? Your possible causal effect by kind of the minimum or the lower uh, confidence, uh, sorry, sorry, the left, uh, I forgot all my words, right? So you can try to kind of uh, say that my effect is at least this much and you can take either the smallest value or the smallest absolute value or take the smallest value minus the, uh, right, the confidence, uh, so so to get like the left hand side of the confidence interval. So yeah, uh, we are not saying ab about kind of how you can use this kind of set of possible effects. So and interestingly, some uh, people have kind of suggested, right, because some of these methods return these multiplicities, like should you count that as this effect is more likely to be true than these other ones? I, I don't I don't think that's kind of a reasonable thing to do. Uh, so we stick with kind of just giving like all the distinct effects. I see, I 
and I saw two other questions. So the first one is actually from Jacob, and Jacob was asking that, I'm wondering if there, there's a, there are analogous to those conditions in more continuous settings. For instance, like in the linear regressions of like identification, identifiability sometimes comes down to some orthogonality criteria. So can we also turn this mm -hmm. combinatorial criteria into some something similar in algebraically or geometrically? Yeah, we I haven't thought about it in that way. I mean, in the sense, yes, we're kind of looking at all um, Right, so, so we're trying to exactly partition this equivalence class so that it's distinct between the different partition. But yeah, so I haven't thought about it geometrically, but I, I mean, it, it is possible because it's, it's a combinatorial problem, right? So yeah, but, but it's, a, it's a good question. Um, I, I guess I don't know. Cool, thank you. And I have one last question from an anonymous attendee asking like, uh, how does the runtime of this algorithm compare to others? Good question. Uh, so we have not implemented this in a very clever way. And you can assume, because it's a recursion, that it doesn't work that great. I can actually show you a slide on comparisons. Uh, right. Uh, so this is the big picture of all the comparison algorithms. And um, an important thing to keep in mind here is, OK, so th these are the computational costs, right? So obviously, enumerating all DAGs is very expensive. Enumerating valid parent sets can be very cheap if you kind of think about it in a local way where you don't um, where you don't implement and further orient uh, your graph. So you just think about combinations that are valid. Um, and our algorithm is kind of somewhere in between. So I'm using green to indicate kind of the best possible version. This would be kind of second best. And then uh, the blues are kind of somewhere in between. Now, our also implementation that we have uh, can be probably improved. But uh, in terms of practical right, uh, runtime, this is, this is what, we, what we got. So the purple one here is actually our method. And you can see that it's not the fastest one. Again, I'm pretty sure we could improve, improve the implementation. We were more interested in the theory here. But uh, yeah, it's not, it doesn't do as well as some of these other methods in terms of how fast it is. So uh, here, local IDA, that's the best, that's the best fastest one. Uh, and then optimal IDA is the one that kind of underestimates the number of possible total effects. So it's fast, but uh, right at what cost? But it, it's a good method. So uh, joint IDA actually tends not to be very fast. Um, uh, sorry, it doesn't tend to be very accurate, but it seems it's still faster than our method. Also, another interesting thing is that it seems to kind of go higher and then crosses over. We have not explored this. Um, this in detail, but as I said, you could probably improve the implementation or uh, if you're interested, you're definitely welcome to do it also. Yeah. Thanks, Emma. Any final questions for Emma? Okay. If no other questions, then that would be the talk. And let's thanks both speakers. And we are holding a gather town link, gather, gather town events, and uh, you can check the chat box and there's a link to that. And I hope to see you there. And thank you all for participating in the seminar. Thanks, everyone, for your questions. Thank you.